Hi, Ketura. Good evening. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Good evening, Ketura. Good evening, Glory. Welcome, welcome. So, uh, yes. Dr. Dr. Manuel is just about to join in. Thank you very much for being here. Our moderator is also online. Um, uh, Dr. Emmanuel, welcome. Yeah, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to come around. Good evening. Good evening. It's a pleasure to have you here. So um, I'll just be in the background. Uh, the moderator will be handling everything. We are also live on Facebook. Um, so I think the moderator will take it from here. I'll just be in the background. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Yes, loud and clear. Sorry, Mano, you. Oh, okay. Yes, yes sounds all right. Yes, um, it's actually an honor and a pleasure to meet you online today. So, just going to keep it brief. Um, just going to, you know, enjoy ourselves because um, it's it's very interesting what you do. Seeing us, you share the very same passions and visions with that of. Um, God's Glory's Foundation. So um, I'm just going to have you know that um, we're going to have 12 minutes to present each three, each of the speakers and then four minutes for the questions I'm going to ask you so that we can have um, some 10, 15 minutes to spare when it comes to questioning. So um, I'm going to start for this speech. I'm going to start with you. Madam Ketura, and then I come to you, Dr. Emmanuel, and then we go to Leon. All right, in that order. So, Madam Ketura, you will begin. Dr. Emmanuel, you continue, and then Leon ends the session. And Sorry, so, I can't hear I don't you. Know, would very you, well. want... you can't hear me very well. Yes, and okay. I'm having a little challenge. I'm still trying to set myself. I don't have light, and my network is. So are you saying I'm the one going first? Yes. Yes, please. You're the one going first. Uh, if it's okay, probably we can swap. Yes, can we swap? I'm trying to get, because they have just taken light here. OK, then Dr. Imano will begin, since um, Leanne is not yet here with us. Dr. Imano, is it OK with you? It's okay, it's okay. Um, just, I think that all okay. this is too much, but I don't know, but, but it's okay. Okay, okay, that's fine. It's okay, okay, that's fine. Would you, would you like to share your screen or you would just like to, you know, bullet some points and all of that? Would you want an opportunity to share your screen? Or to make a presentation? Or something. Yeah, sorry. Um, I don't have the PowerPoint, so I can just share whatever I want to share. Cool. Hold on. Hold on. That's, yeah. that's fine. That's fine. That, that's uh, that's right. Okay, so um, let's just, um, you know, relax and then wait for our final speaker. And then hopefully some of our participants will have joined and then we can begin the session. It's six, it's six on my end and I know it's seven on your end already. So let's just give it some time and if we can reach out to our last speaker to join us so that we can start here. Yeah. That would be great.
Madam Ketura, please, is my audio okay for you now? Yes, it's better now. Oh, okay. Okay, that's fine. Then I think my headphones will do the, the magic. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for making it for the Glory Ifezue Foundation's International Day of Education. Okay, thank you so much for making it. On the topic, an investment in basic education is an investment in grassroots and vulnerable communities. I mean, this is an initiative she started to change the face of civic engagement, civic education, and to encourage active citizen participation in community development in Nigeria. And her foundation happens to be a neoteric publicist offering deeper understanding for better solutions as regards active civic engagement and community development in Nigeria, starting from the grassroots to all sectors of the Nigerian society. And I mean, we have great personalities, notable personalities who happen to share that very same passion and are also actively involved in community development activities. And we have you here today to share with us and discuss with us on the topic. And the topic again is an investment in basic education is an investment in grassroots and vulnerable communities. And we are Humbly welcome, we are all humbly welcome to once again the Glory Ifezwe Foundation International Day of Education 2023 in partnership with the Passion Foundation, Girls Education Mission International, and TNCMEF, which is the Timothy Nwako Chukuma Memorial Education Foundation. And I am your moderator for today. And my name is Janet Ousudako. And I'm from Ghana. I'm joining you from Ghana. And so I'm honored to be here. And please, I would also appreciate it if participants can also introduce themselves in the chat box and then tell us where you are joining us from. And it will be very great. Opportunity will be given for questioning. And so we ask that before that, you would mute your mics and then you would mute, you would mute your videos as well so that we can all focus. You can also follow the live stream link in the chats that in the in chat box. So the link will be provided here. And then um, you can share the link to your friends to join in as well, to our colleagues, our friends to join in as well. So we have with us three speakers today. So Dr. Chukuma is actually, um, I actually refer to him as engineer Dr. Chukuma. So engineer Dr. Chukuma is an environmental engineering 
and a lecturer at Nam the Azikiwe University Orca, Anambra State. Okay, he's actually the director of the Timothy Nwakochukuma Memorial Education Foundation. He is a member of many professional bodies, such as American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers. ASABE, the Nigeria Institute of Agricultural Engineers, Nigeria Society of Engineers, and a registered professional engineer with Council for the Regulations of Engineering in Nigeria. That's current. I mean, he has more than 60 publications and in peer reviewed journals and more than 10 conference papers presented in national and international conferences. I mean, I could go on and on. He will prove himself today when he gives us his own discussion and topics on what we are about to have today. Thank you so much for being here with us. We really appreciate your time, doctor. Thank you so much. And we have Madam Ketura. Madam Ketura Shama is actually an award-winning humanitarian, philanthropist, human rights champion, digital ambassador, and change maker whose life is dedicated to defending, protecting, and promoting girls' rights to education through advocacy and impact programs delivery. She began her career in nonprofit establishment and leading of an organization that enabled girls and young women the opportunity to fulfill their potential. Her core experience at Girls Education Mission International, where she currently serves as executive director, is developing and driving operational strategy, optimizing resources, process, and people improvement, corporate communication, translating strategy into actionable goals for optimal performance, growth, and sustainability. Being a skilled edutech, Madam Ketura has facilitated impact-driven education and digital skills campaigns within Nigeria. She has led women technology workshops, teachers and supervisors of education, professional workshops, menstrual hygiene management campaigns, among others. We, I, we could go on and on. We have great achievers with us here today. And I'm actually honored to also be here. And we have uh, Leanne. Nia Leanne Onyedula, she's actually the co-founder and president of El Passion Foundation, an NGO based in Abuja, Nigeria, okay? The El Passion Foundation, or EPF, as it's commonly known, is a non-profit with the goal of bridging the socioeconomic gap between low-income families and families of higher economic status through outreach, education, and research. Leanne has sponsored the education of over 30 secondary and post-secondary students, spearheaded a campaign advocating for increased access to menstrual products in secondary schools and hosted seminars on youth development in the FCT and I am an emo state. Okay. Her, she actually is the co-founder and president of El Passion Foundation. Thank you so much for making the time. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have you here. Um, this is the International Day of Education 2023, organized by Glory Ifez Web Foundation, in partnership with El, El Passion Foundation, Girls Education Mission International, and MEF. We kindly ask that you mute yourselves and then you also turn off your videos so that we can all concentrate. So, Dr. Emmanuel Chikuma, we are going to begin with you. So on the topic, an investment in basic education is an investment in grassroots and vulnerable communities. What do you have for us today? You have the floor. Oh, thank you, Janet. Um, I hope people thank can you. hear me clearly. Yes, please. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Um, um, thank you, moderator. And then I want to also appreciate the host, Gore Faso Foundation. Um, I think um, the move to um, bring together a number of NGOs that are in education sector um, is a real one and um, something to be appreciated. So um, kudos to you and then we'll pray for greater wisdom and strength to um, um, continue with this line of action. I think is something commendable. Okay, so um, 
Um, I have a number of things that I would like to talk about. An investment in basic education is an investment in grassroots and vulnerable communities. Um, there is a big gap between um, rural communities and then urban areas. Um, I have a personal experience and then um, Um, investors are people who are profit-minded, okay? So um, they are thinking about what to gain or money to make from an investment. So an ideal place for an investor to make is actually a place where he will make profit. And then naturally, rural areas as is not well known for that. So an area... That is from hello. Am I getting yes? Hello, please. yes, please. We, we can hear you. Okay, so, um, so, um, um, some of my experiences include, um, I Last year, we worked with an N or the group, and then realized that the number of primary school students, their uniform are torn, and then some of them don't have uniform. Some of them come to school barefooted, and then there was a project we engaged that has to do with kind of putting a fence in a secondary school because students usually come two, three hours after school. That I mean, the morning um, assembly, and they will also want to live through that place. And then, um. So there are probably experiences that rural people are vulnerable to. And then um, I think the essence of this program is to encourage investment in rural areas, having seen that there's a big gap between the urban areas and rural areas. So I want to be practical. There are specific or pragmatic steps we must have to take as individuals, as a group, if we make it a relative the gap between rural areas and then urban areas. One of them is um, there is need to have increased activities of NGOs in rural areas. Let me say it again. There is need to have increased activities of NGOs in rural areas. Um, NGOs are known for profit organization, and then most likely if, um, their goal is not well tailored. Most of them want to operate in urban areas. But like I said, rural areas are not profits targeted areas, but NGOs activities need to be increased in rural areas. And that is one of the things I want to encourage every one of us to do. You might not really know the big difference between what happens in rural areas until you have to go in there. So um, that's number one thing I have to say. There is need for increased activities of NGOs in the rural area. I had an experience during COVID-19 and I want to be practical. So um, one of my uncle in the US called me and then said um, he has a feeling to help people during this COVID-19. He learned that people have not been going out to work and then um, people are hungry. Is there a way he's going to help? I told him, yes, please um, just send some funds. We want to go to one of the um, primary schools and then share food items. So at the end of the day, we had about 17 bags of rice and then a lot of things were shared. Oh my, a lot of women were crying in kind of a jubilation that they never expected this. Okay, so what am I saying? There is need for people to what, look for increased activities of NGOs. People would make sure they attract donors, whether um, uh, formal or informal way, so the resources will be able to get to these areas. Okay, so that's one of the things I want to say. So um, in addition to that, there is need for more recreation activities in rural areas. You know, um, a number of, there are a number of fun places in urban areas, children on weekends who decide to go with their parents to kind of 
and good shop malls and then have children recreation activities but when you look at some of these rural areas um they are faced with just three triangles go to school go to church and maybe go to market or farm or whatever and still come back home so um their life is so boring so um one of the resources we need to invest in some of these rural areas is if you look recreational activities do some of these things attract grants or write proposals that will help in having um, a number of these recreational activities in rural areas it will go a long way to make these children happy okay then um also on this also on this um there is also need to donate books help library in these rural areas so um, I've had some of these experiences and then um, a number of these children struggle with what only the teacher can offer them. They don't have ability to assess books by themselves. And then um, I, when I was in secondary school, I knew the big difference between just working on what the teacher can offer and then having access to a very good test book. A very good test book can make a whole lot of difference. But some of these students in rural areas, um, they are not really have, they don't have access to some of these books. Their parents are poor and then just give them the basic books and then they are struggling. Number of questions they can't answer, they don't know where to go to. So um, an investment in donating books, creating recreational activities, increased activity of NGOs in rural areas is a big way to help bridge the gap between rural areas and then urban area. Okay, um, I hope, I'm making, I'm making progress. I hope I'm, I'm making a point. Yes, yes, please, you are. Okay, can I go ahead? Yes, please. Okay, so um, another area that I think that needs um, to be done is the need for um, human capacity or human resources in rural areas. And then, of course, um, because of the um, poor remuneration from government and then private institutions knows that they might be able to make profits in rural areas. They are left with um, teachers who are kind of um, maybe have some of these disadvantage that they come move to urban area, maybe because of the family stage or whatever. But I also want to say that we need to um, have this mind of being volunteers. Okay, I encourage people, there's a lot of things to do as a young guy, there's a lot of things to do as a young lady, a lot of things to do to help humanity. Okay, I want to know a lady that sometimes she offers just five hours a day during um, a period of, I think that was when she finished her work, and then she just goes there to nursery schools and just help to take care of the kids. So um, a number of these rural areas, voluntary activities or volunteers can help to encourage or boost human capacity or human resource in these places. So there is a lot to do. And then, uh, like I said, we have to be practical about these things. We have to um, have the passion to do that. We have to think of going extra mile. I don't want to talk so much about the government because um, I'm not talk I don't know, I don't think we have any governor or a minister of education or commission of education or such people here so i think we're talking to ourselves let's encourage our young people to um invest their time um in voluntary activities in all these primary secondary and nursery school okay um do i still have small time to talk hello yes please you do yes please you do about wow. five minutes is okay. Yeah, five minutes. Okay, five minutes. Okay, so um, that's why I, we need to have more volunteers. Let young people make. We need to encourage them. Like I, I run an NGO both in environment and in education, and then I encourage people to give their time to some of these things because um, like I keep saying, sometimes we have this ideology that. It is where you make an investment in the church that you will be rewarded. But when you make it outside the church, um, your reward might not be as much as that. But I keep saying this, it is not, it's not true. Any reward you make for the sake of humanity 
whether in the church or outside the church, gets rewarded. And actually, every any effort to make towards advancement of humanity gets rewarded by God. So we need to encourage our young people. Um, some of them have this religious mindset that whenever you talk about making investment, they only think about church. So when you talk about where can you go and spend your time, they feel cleaning up the church is good. But when you talk about cleaning up the streets and they start asking you for money, yeah, somebody is into some of them can um, serve as good student teacher in their churches. But when you talk about going to orphanage and then assist these children, they, they see differently. So we need to encourage young people, let them have passion to make impacts in rural areas as volunteers. It has a lot of benefit for us. Then, like I said, um, the guiding principle for any form of investment must not be profits. And that is what the mindset of any NGO should have. We're not here. NGOs are not meant to for, for profit making. Um, the, the mindset is adding value to humanity and then trying to create a legacy. Okay, so with this mindset, it becomes easy to think of investment in rural areas. But without it, um, even NGOs might not see rural areas as a viable option. So uh, let me say this as I finalize or conclude. Um, we have a, low, a role to play and Glory Faisal Foundation has already started something. I want to encourage every one of us to um, join hands and ensure that the gap between rural areas in terms of basic um, education is breached by NGOs um, trying to engage in more activities in rural areas. And I bet you um, sometimes we might not be recognized nationally or globally, but like I keep saying, um, God is in heaven and he rewards every good effort of humanity. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Please, let's be pragmatic. Let's be practical. Let's go into action and see how we can effect changes in rural areas because um, all humans are equal except for the classes or differences that has been created by humanity. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you to Dr. Imano. We really appreciate it. I mean, you have touched on almost all the points of, you know, bridging the gap between rural and urban education with respect to resources, government teachers, placement posting and teacher remuneration. You have touched on increase, you have increased activities of NGOs in rural areas, even though those areas are not profit target areas. Uh, we also need to engage in activities to attract more donors and funders learn how to write grants and proposal and the need for recreational activities in rural areas and you've also touched on the fact that we need to donate books not just any books but the needed and quality books that these kids need in the rural areas and you've also touched on the fact that young people should invest their time and not just young people but we need to have the spread of volunteerism the ability to boost human capital and encourage other people to also engage in activities that will touch lives. Thank you very much, sir. I mean, you have actually answered my question. And please, if you have any question, kindly put it in the in chat box and they will be responded accordingly. Thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. Madam Ketura, please, if you are ready, we are also ready for you. Whilst Madam Leanne also prepares herself. Um, an investment in basic education is an investment in grassroots and vulnerable communities. Let's have your take on that. You have the floor. Thank you very much for the time. I will have to be on audio for because of the network. I want to appreciate, first of That's all, fine. appreciate appreciate this opportunity for me to speak here and not just speak to fulfill my, my passion because education is, is, is a passion to me. So I see this is a privilege. So, but let, let me start this way with the, looking at the theme of the year 2023 for the International Day of Education, which says to invest in people, prioritize education. This topic, I think this team is one of the best team ever. Prioritizing education. And coming back to the 
organizers topic that said an investment in basic education is an investment in grassroots and vulnerable communities. You know, we know education as a human right, but education is more than a human right. Why prioritizing education is because education is an irrevocable asset and also a tool to break the cycle of poverty. So it means almost every development starts with education. And that is why I'm so much interested for the organizers to consider this topic an investment in basic education. Why basic education? We know anything that is basic, that is the foundation. And it is, we know that in every building, when the foundation is faulty, it's very difficult for a house to stay. So I'm so much impressed for that topic. Coming back to my own topic, how can parents in rural areas be encouraged and enlightened? to be effectively involved in the educational development of their awards, looking at their orientation, scope of interest, and level of education. So now, let me start by having us, let's understand when, when we talk about basic education in Nigeria, let's speak in the context. I realize that our moderator is not from Nigeria, but we have almost the same experience in Africa. In Nigeria, we have the policy of education and we also have the Universal Basic Education Act, which has stated the role of government in ensuring every child has access, have access to quality basic education and the role of all stakeholders. And if we look at the UBE, UBE Act, that is Universal Basic Education Act. There are three key stakeholders that are responsible on ensuring every child have access to basic quality education. I look at them as three. One is the government, government as the key stakeholder. Then we have the parents. They are also a key stakeholder and also the local com com community mem members they also have a role in ensuring that children have access to basic education. So in limiting it to my topic, how to encourage and enlighten parents, to me, I have few points that I want to just elaborate a bit. Number one is to ensure the policy on education and also the UBE Act is being implemented effectively. What captured my attention in the policy of education in Nigeria is where it says that the federal government of Nigeria has a covenant. The covenant between the Nigerian government and the Nigerian child is to provide access to quality education. It's a covenant. And when we say something that is covenant is a serious matter. And it's a covenant between the government and every child in Nigeria to ensure every child, whether you are a, in rural area, because the policy has not mentioned that the policy is for children in urban areas, is for all children in Nigeria. So the, the first thing we can do to encourage parents is to ensure that the policy of education and also the UBE Act is being implemented in uniform. Because why are we focusing on rural area? That shows that there is a difference between rural and urban areas in the aspect of involvement of parents or in the aspect of assessing quality education. But the policies and the documents are not different. We don't have policy for rural communities. We don't have policy for urban communities. So I still say the point is that the government should ensure full implementation of all these policies and laws, even in rural areas. And what are they? The UBE Act aim at ensuring compulsory free education. Government should make education completely free. You know, poverty is one of the things that discourage parents to involve 
to, to involve in the education of their children because they feel, no, I don't have the, the, the resources. So, you know, I, I can't engage in such activities. I will not, I can't even send my child to school. But when education is free, parents will be motivated to send their children. And you know, those free services that are expected by the government to provide are free books. This is in the UBE Act of Nigeria. The government are supposed to provide free books to the children. So if parents know that I don't have to buy books for my children, for my work to go to school, they will have interest in that education of their children. Also, they are to provide instructional materials. They are supposed to provide infrastructures. They are supposed to provide classrooms. That is a good environment. And also a lunch. That is a meal. Well, in Nigeria, there is, there, there is attempt of, even though it's not everywhere, the school feeding program, but there are so many in rural areas where you go, you see children sitting on the, under the tree. This, is, this becomes very discouraging for parents. You know, you can't even involve in the activities to ensure performance of your child. You have to enroll your child first. So all these things that the parents are seeing, government not doing their work, discourages them from even enrolling their children. Remember, we said they have an orientation. They also have the, the, the scope of their interest. Their interest is limited than those in the urban area. Their orientation about the importance of education is not as those in urban areas. And also considering their level of education. So they need something that will attract them. They need something that is up, that yes, when this that is different from their own perception, so that it will attract them to really have interest in the education of their children. Imagine the parent knows that when my child goes to school, will have a free books. The teachers have instructional materials that they can teach my my children effectively and they have chairs, they can see that is the infrastructure and they will sit under a roof, that is a classroom. And also at the end of the day during break time, they will have a meal. You'd, with all these things, if all these things are on ground, I think part of the work has been done. The parents without even doing anything, they will be attracted to involved in the education of their words. So secondly, that is the, the, the role of the government, either at the federal or at the state level. Then we have in, in one of the role, if according to the UB Act, I have seen only the role of parents is to send their children to school because there's, the education is supposed to be compulsory free, everything is supposed to be provided. All what the parent needs is to send their children to school. Well, the local education stakeholders have the responsibility of creating awareness. That is their role because they are the ones that are very close to the community, to the parents. So my first point is for the policies of education and the UBE Act to be implemented in uniform, not just in rural area, different from the urban area. Secondly, there should be an open communication between the school management, the teachers and the parents. There should be an effective communication. Let the parent know what is happening in the school. If they know the activities of the school, what their children are going in school, their experiences is very easier for them to involve in. The next point is they should be involved in decision makings. We know we have we have parent teachers associations 
Well, I, I, I'm not sure if that one really exists in public school. I know mostly it is in private school that you see where parents are being asked to come together with the teachers, maybe once or twice in a term. They, are, they, are, they will be asked to bring some of their decisions. Issues about the school will be presented to them and they are being given opportunity to express their mind and bring ideas and also be part of the decision making. So if the parents are part of decision making in the school, it is very easier for them. They are even involving because that, that shows that you are involving them in the activities of, in the education of their children. And you know, well, just as from what we, we, we mentioned, most of us are organizers, that is a, people that have been on social work, you know, most at times we, we are after providing solutions to communities. We know as social workers, when you are taking a solution to a problem in a community, you have to go and buy the idea of the community. As they get their acceptance, most of for sustainability, so for, you, for, for a school, you can't just say you are on your own. You have to work with the parent. Let the parent also give contribution on how successful you run the school for the better performance of their children. And that can be done just as I've said through PTA meeting. Making them stakeholders, that will make the parents to see themselves as stakeholders. Next point is, the school should always give a positive feedback on children to the parents. It's not just only when the child has done something wrong or the child came to school late, he's, he doesn't come to school every day. We all, then we now meet the parent and say, these are the issues we have with your child or when it is time to pay school fees, that, should, that will be when we will communicate with parents. If class teachers will, just like that, call parents or meet parents and give a good feedback about their children. That is when the children did something good, perform well in school. With good feedback is a motivation to parents to really be interested in the education of their children. Another point is home visit. You know, I'm happy because it's, it's, we are talking about rural areas. So mostly in rural areas are the same people in the community. Some are having people that are even their relatives, their uncles that are teachers. So visiting them in homes is not a big deal. It's not a big deal because it's a community. So, but when a teacher visits a child in his, in, in his, at his home, the teacher will be able to understand the kind of environment the teacher is. Imagine a teacher visiting the child family, how the parents will feel. So that creates a good relationship between the parents and the teachers. Let's take, for example, if a child doesn't go to school, the, the child has not gone to school maybe for three days, and the teacher visits that child at home. You know, there, there, there will be a feeling of, I have, I, have been pre I have been absent in school. That coming, that visit, even without the teacher saying anything, I believe the following day, the parent will send the, the child back to school. So I think home visit, not that it should be very frequent, but at least once in a while, maybe in a town, you visit. That shows how you care about the child. And also the second thing is to encourage the child. Well, there is, we, in my organization, one of the, our project is training of teachers. I remember in one of the training, one of the facilitators has taught the teachers that is not, even though it's a debatable matter, he said the, the teacher should not repeat a child. A teacher should not repeat a child. You know, when they, when, imagine as a, as a parent, you send a child to school. 
from primary, let's say he's in primary, in primary, primary two, instead of going to two, to three, he has been repeated, he has been in primary two for two years. As a parent, you'll be discouraged. Well, this is debatable, but it is even questionable that if a teacher, imagine if, if a child is not performing, that, that means there is a problem with the teaching. Ma, please, you have about two minutes more. All right. Yes, ma. So also, the, another point is the teacher should be a role model. You know, just as I've said, mostly in the rural community, it's just like a family. Everybody, the parent knows the teachers. So, but when the character, the characteristics of the teacher can discourage parents from being involved, from supporting their children. Because this is someone that I know, a teacher, he drinks, he womanizes everywhere, all this, he, the responsible parent, will, how can I, most especially girls, entrust my daughter to this man or to this woman? Or imagine as a parent of a child in a community, you fight with a teacher. So teachers should also be a role model. I know there is a code of conduct of teachers. Is a has a responsibility to conduct, teacher has a re responsibility to conduct himself very well. That can also attract parents and motivate them to be involved. Building trust and treat parents with respect. You know, let me just give an example. I remember during a PTA of one of the PTA of my, I went for my children, one of the parents, her issue was the teacher shouted on her. She wasn't happy. And she took that case to the higher authority. So, you know, teachers should also treat parents with, with respect. One act can discourage parents from being involved and involving supporting the education of their children. So thank you very much. Thank you very I, I, much. I believe maybe at the thank course you. we can make some points. Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you very, very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are once again um, welcome to the 2023 Glory in Phase International Day of Education. We've had Dr. Emmanuel Chukuma present on his topic, the gap on the topic an investment in basic education is an investment in grassroots and vulnerable communities looking at the gaps or bridging the gaps between rural and education rural and urban education with respect to resources teacher remuneration teacher post and all of that he told us that we need to have increased activities of ngos in rural areas we need to have people who can attract donors we need to be more intentional about creating recreational activities in rural areas and we also need to invest in voluntary activities we need to invest our time we need to have the spirit of volunteerism and madam ketua just went on continued with hers about having encouraging parents to get actively involved in the education of their children looking at their scope level of education and their orientation she has given us a lot she has told us that parents need attractive actions to encourage them we need to have a uniform implementation of the ube and policy uh, policies to create awareness for them, a uniform implementation of the UB Act and an educational act for both rural and urban education. We need to have effective and open communication between parents and the schools. The school should involve the parents. He has also said that parents should be involved in the decision-making processes of their children in the schools. Teachers should serve as role models to these kids. The parents should be treated with respect and there should be the building of trust between teachers, parents, the schools and the parents and the children and their teachers. So all these go more on and on she has presented on a lot now we have our final speaker leanne onyegula is here with us madam leanne if you are here kindly make yourself known so we can have you you are the final person to talk about an investment in basic education it's an investment in grassroots and vulnerable communities please you have the floor 
Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I just want to say first, thank you to the foundation for um, organizing this. This is amazing. Um, being able to talk about education together with other people who are in the education space is something that's very, very, um, that I don't think I take for granted and I don't think anyone else who spoke today takes for granted. I also want to thank and I also want to talk about how good the other speakers were. I learned so much hearing about how we can invest from edu in education and how parents are stakeholders in education, how to encourage them. So great topics. Okay, so my topic is how can we continue to effectively invest in building and sustaining the capacity of the basic education sector for unprecedented and unexpected situations. It's a mouthful. That's a lot of words in just one question. So I will break that down first by remodifying that question. The question says, why, how can we continue to effectively invest? I will pose that we should just take out continue to effectively invest and just talk about how could we just invest in the building of um, the basic education sector because the way it is right now, it's not it's not very strong. It's very unstable. The foundations are very weak. People like to say something um, like if they say people if when people say something is bare bones, they mean there's nothing on it. It's um, if anyone has ever built a house or if anyone knows anything about building a house, you always know that you have the wooden structures first before you put on those bricks. So when anyone says something is bare bone, they're just talking about the wooden structures. And I'm saying that the education and sector right now is bare bones. It's just the wooden structures, nothing else. So we, let's talk about how we can invest in that first, okay? So I'm gonna talk about basically from my experience with the educational sector. I know they already introduced me. So um, I've worked, I've been working for a few years now, about four years now with um, like schools around Abuja, both in rural areas and urban areas. My focus is in public schools because if we're being honest, private schools, most times they have the resources and fundings they need to run. However, public schools, that's a whole diff different question. What I have seen in every public school I've been in, both in Abuja and I've worked a little bit in Imo State as well, is that there's a lack of access to books, like was mentioned earlier by one of the speakers. There's a lack of access to just basic classroom um, resources like tables, chairs, um, whiteboards. There's a lack of access to all that in public schools. There's also a lack of engagement of students in public schools. And I don't know if people know this, but children, especially in basic education, basic education basically refers to primary schools, right? Children are some of the they have one of the lowest attention spans of any other human beings. And that's okay because they, they are developing. But what, what we see is that in public schools, there's no emphasis on that. So we have kids who don't remember what they learned from yesterday, for example, or for the week before. Um, and that system is already so weak that anything that happens, including COVID, is just designed to fail. So I'm going to talk about the COVID factor. You know, I like to call it the COVID factor because no one was expecting COVID, right? What we saw was that COVID created a system of chaos in the educational system. Yeah. Um, let's say if we knew what we're doing barely before um, COVID, after COVID, nothing makes sense. So most students moved onto classes, but lacked the knowledge from the class previously. Right. So we have kids who maybe now are in primary three, primary four, but because of COVID, they really didn't learn anything in primary two, primary one, but they have found themselves in this new class and they actually still don't know anything about primary one or primary two. I'll give you an example. So we host or we actually have a program called the Weekend School Project, which is one of my best project. I love that project so much because it is targeted at the idea of creating resources and bridging that gap that COVID caused. So we, what we see in this program and what we've done from our research um, of the students is that we saw that... Oh, okay, someone's mic is on. So if you don't mind, just turn okay. your mic off. Thank you. But I will continue. What we did see was that um, students don't know Students in grade three still don't know the content for grade one. So we're talking things as basic as counting. Okay, so counting is something that you should learn around the age of six. Um, something that you should know how to do. It's pretty much one of the first steps in learning math, if not the first step. 
And we see that people around the age of nine, age of 10, age of eight, still don't know how to count. They do not know how to spell. And when I'm saying they don't know how to count, I'm not saying they don't know how to count from 100. I mean, they don't know how to count from one. Okay, so, and this is in rural um, areas as well. This uh, automatically shows you something. It shows you that first off, the system before wasn't working for them. Secondly, it shows you that the system now is probably even worse than it was before. Right, so the pre-COVID problem was that there was a problem with everything, problem with the curriculum, um, engagement and learning wasn't prioritized. There was a problem in funding. No one was funding public schools in the way they should fund public schools. Uh, there was a disconnect between teachers and, um, and students, right? The post-COVID problem is that these problems exist, but they exist on a much higher level and much intense level, intensified level than they did before. It's more pronounced. Right. So what the question is, so how could we even invest in a system that already exists in such a way, in such a way that's not very concrete, such a way that's not stabilized? So what I like to think about is that we can't build for the unpre unprecedented if the system itself already has gaps. I can't build and for tomorrow if today I don't have anything to build with or to build on. So let's talk about, so what I'm going to talk about first, before we talk about anything for the future, is what we could do today. How can we invest in those gaps today to ensure stability for unprecedented, unprecedented times? Okay, so the first thing would be to advocate for better curriculums, better fundings. Um, this one is, what I think, one of the hardest uh, points on my paper, points that I'm going to pitch to everyone today. Talking directly to the government. I know in Nigeria, it's really hard to um, talk to local um, leaders, talk to the government, talk to the education minister, whoever you want to call. It's really hard to reach out to them to say, this is the community I work with and this is what we're seeing because it's everywhere. Uh, I don't think I've been into any rural community where I haven't seen this. And the deeper I go, you know, the deeper you go into rural communities, the worse it gets, to be honest. But we need to still advocate. We still need to whatever little voice we have, whatever little resources we have, we need to continue to make sure that we reach out to the government to let them know that this is what we want. The education system isn't great the way it is, and we want kids to be educated. Education is the first step to anything in life, especially in when it comes to critical thinking, thinking as an adult, thinking as a human being, education is needed, and a good education, these kids deserve, not just deserve because, you know, they're, um, they're of a certain status, so they live somewhere special. They deserve it because it's a right. So, you know, always talking about the rights of education, advocating for that. The second step, which is a lot more practical and less more advocating and more about solution-oriented goals, which I think a lot of people here might be because if you're in the NGO space, you are looking for solutions for problems. That step would be to create programs targeted at rural um, communities. I, and I think a, a lot of NGOs right now do that. That's not something that's new. But I want to say we should take more creative programs to the rural areas. It shouldn't just be, I know giving people things and giving, um, donating stuff, donating books is important, donating chairs and tables, that's important. But let's talk about something even more concrete. Let's create actual educational programs to fill in that gap between what kids learn and what they're supposed to learn. Again, that's what something our program at Weekend School Project does. Our goal is not just to give the resources that we have to the kids, but it's to make sure that when we go there, we're teaching kids how to count if they don't know how to count. We're teaching kids what phonemes are if they don't know what those are. We're teaching kids about health, you know, because health is important. To think, teaching them about running around, what sports means. We're teaching them how to be good citizens and what human rights means, what rights they have as children. So we need to create more programs that are more in that realm. Programs that are in that realm, that are long-term, that are short-term, that actually take education that we have maybe in urban settings to rural public schools until we can get the government to actually implement this to the curriculum and implement this in the school itself. So... Let's, outside of NGOs, volunteers could do this. Grassroots volunteers everywhere are already you know, creating little programs of their own. I know people who would gather their kids in their community to have like little local clubs. I also know people who would go to, if they don't live in rural communities, who would go to the nearest rural community, buy them. 
and they would have clubs they would gather the kids they would have a soccer club for example teach kids how to um play soccer but teach them something about health teach them about um you know how to brush their teeth if that's something that primary school kids need to learn or we could have summer or long vacation programs that's when kids for that one month kids are at home there is no school it doesn't affect school okay let's bring them together let's talk to them about math and science let's talk about to them about stem let's create nice science experiments you know I, kids love science experiments they love even if it's something small like bring vinegar and baking soda and put them together let's see everything explode kids are so engaged by those kinds of content let's do that so that the kids in the rural areas they want to learn okay next step schools need to teach their teachers which is very counterintuitive. What do you mean teacher, teacher? Teachers are supposed to be the ones teaching. What we're talking, what I'm talking about in that point is that they need to focus on the way they teach. What is the teaching style? If your teaching style is not engaging for people below the age of what, maybe 12, they're not going, no one is, they're not probably not going to remember what you said. No one's going to remember. They're not paying attention. You need to remind them. You need to have a reason to pull them in so that they have a reason to listen. Let's focus on teaching the role of independent learning and spark a curiosity for learning. School shouldn't be somewhere you come to where it's like, where you're just, what is A? A is for Apple. What is B? B is for Ball. No, it should be, let's talk, let's explore the concept of um, addition today. If we have three balls here and we have four balls here and we count them together, what does it look like? That is engaging. That makes kids want to learn. Right. Then also on the independent learning front, let's make kids want to go home by themselves and create equations for themselves. Let's make them want to have little study groups with their little friends in school or even back home in rural areas. We should make them want to do those kinds of things, but they could only do that if they are interested in learning in the first place. So we need to teach them to be interested in learning. OK, we need to create this hunger for learning because the hunger for learning would teach children, would push children, push students to explore education, even when the system is not stable. That is very key. We can't assure that the system will be stable today or next year, but we can make sure we put things in place that even when the system is not stable, students are learning, students are exploring, students want to explore themselves. Okay, those are my short-term um, solutions. Now let's talk about the long-term solutions in terms of COVID and unprecedented times. The first thing will be to invest in technology. This is a big, very, very big undertaking by anyone who wants to um, do it. But what we could start with is doing grassroots, um, grassroots donations to rural areas to bring up, you know, maybe if, if it's one or two laptops in, those, in that school, so kids could start learning. Obviously, we were not going to um, donate a laptop without teaching kids how to use the laptop. This is where the other point about programs would come in. So if you donate two laptops and someone else comes to come and teach the kids with a program how to use, be computer literate, how to use a computer to make different things, to use Google Word, all those kinds of things. Now we've already got into that next step. With the incorporation of technology, we can make sure that even in the future, when kids are at home, if they have to work from home, do school from home, that they have, they already have the knowledge on how it works. They already have a way to learn. Okay, and then the next thing would be a book lending program. Book lending program would be where kids can come to school, get a book, take the book home, read it, do use the book and bring it back. Investing in those kinds of programs will allow that kids, if school does shut down for any reason, can take books home to continue learning at home. When you pair that with the independent learning tools that, the, tools that they would have learned in the short term, when you pair that with a system that lets them take books home, it's, it's a win-win situation. Everyone, they go home, they're reading because they like reading. They come back, they get another book they're reading. We need to make sure that we invest in those foundations first, the foundations of education first, before we think about anything else. And those are the both short-term and um, long-term plans. I want to ask how, many, how much time do I have left? If I want to go into something else. You have two minutes left. Two minutes, great. Okay, I will round up. So this is my okay. last point. My last point is to everyone on this call. 
everyone on this call is either someone who's a grassroots um, you know, organizer or has an NGO or you're a volunteer. So my, my, my talk right now is for the volunteers. Your work is just as important as every, but everybody else's work on this call, everybody else's work anywhere, because your work is targeted at helping students without those that funding, without just for the passion of it. I'm going to implore you to look for programs that are targeting education in rural areas. Look for programs that are giving something, whether just if you want to do something very short, whether just donating, uh, helping them donate these resources that we need to the schools or if you want something more long term you could become a volunteer teacher in a program if you're in abuja that would be a great opportunity to check out our weekend school project at our foundation if you want to volunteer it's not something that's very demanding it's during the weekends you come in you volunteer and you go because this is how we actually stabilize the educational system that's one of the only solutions we have right now if anyone wants any questions, I would put that in the, with obviously permission from the moderator to put the details in the chat so we could all connect, but look for also volunteer, volunteering um, opportunities around you if you're not in Abuja, or if you don't want to volunteer where we are, volunteer somewhere else. Look, look for places to help when it comes to education, because we need the help, we all the help that we can get. Again, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here. It was a great listen to everyone. And I hope someone got one thing or two things from what I said. Thank you. Thank you so much as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you for making. You can share the link in the chat and then we can copy, we can share around as well. Thank you so much, Leanne. Thank you so much, Madam Ketua. Thank you so much, Dr. Emmanuel. Leanne has provided a lot, short-term goals, long-term goals. I mean, yeah, she said we should take out the continue and then focus on investing because the foundations are not strong yet. I mean, if we can't build for the unprecedented, if the system already has, we can't build for the unprecedented if the system already has gaps. And it's true. She spoke about advocating for better curriculums and better funding, you know, um, creating more, cre bringing up more creative programs targeted at rural communities, you know, um, having summer or long vacation programs or funcation or edgy fun activities to get children in rural areas more involved in education activities, you know, also train teachers with a particular skill and strategy to help them deliver quality education according to the level of understanding of the kit. And let's make children interested in learning activities, learning independently, and then help encouraging them to explore. We also have to learn in investing in technology, grassroots donations to rural areas, and then book lending programs, encouraging children to take books home to continue learning i mean books and topics they are interested in you know they could be video uh, picture books and all of those stuff and then these children let's let's help them bring their creativity to life because working with children is a whole different ballgame it's not like adults where you could just sit down and no children below the ages of 10 you can't hold them down not even 12 year olds they always want to be active the adrenaline rush in them and all and we've also been encouraged to take up volunteering activities thank you so much each and every one of us for making the time thank you so much glory ifesway foundation for organizing this great session an investment in basic education is an investment in in grassroots and vulnerable communities. Thank you so much. Um, the Partners Al Passion Foundation, Girls Education Mission International, um, the Timothy Wako Chikuma Memorial Education Foundation. Thank you so much for your time. If we have any questions, we have only just two minutes to ask our questions. Put them in the in chat box and let's see. And in the meantime, the link, Leanne has just provided the link. Let's follow those links and, you know, help people out. People need our help. People really do need our help. And then we will share on all our various social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, the recording. And so other people were not able to make it for this 
events could also watch and see how far people are going and the depth of impact people are making in the rural areas thank you so much for your time thank you everybody thank you so much for your time we have some togolese with us we have nadej Nadej is joining us from Togo. I'm joining you from Ghana, and I'm seeing people from Enugu State joining in. Um, Igwe is from Nigeria. Um, yeah, I think most of the participants are Nigerians. Very few of us are from Ghana, Togo, and the other countries. Thank you so much for your time. If God's glory is here, uh, we would love to have you, the host, to close us, because it's not been an easy task you've taken upon yourself thank you so much you have the thank floor you. thank you so much janet you have been an amazing uh, moderator um good evening everyone um thank you so much for being here um i don't need any introduction i'm god's glory uh thank you for making out time to join us this evening to commemorate the international day of education uh, just like all our speakers have said, the theme this year is one that really resonated with, with all of us, really. Uh, when I spoke with the speakers, each of them was very passionate about the topic, and that really made me happy because you want somebody who is passionate about the topic to speak on that topic. And um, I'm very, very glad that the lineup of speakers are the lineup of people that we celebrated this day with. Um, and I'm very happy that we, all of us are doing amazing work, especially at the grassroots. And that's something that really um, spoke to me as well. Um, I'm very happy with the work and uh, Leanne is doing, with the work that Kitura is doing, with the work that Dr. Chokoma is doing. And um, I'm hopeful that we can keep making more impact in our communities. Um, we've just yesterday and today uh, done a, primary school reading competition. And just like Leanne said, to find um, different ways of contributing to what is already on the ground. And so what we did was to have a reading that is different from what the teachers are teaching them a little bit. Uh, we emphasize a bit, a bit on the phone, actually a lot more on the phonics, uh, ph uh, phonemics, phonics awareness, uh, fluency, and to just see that primary school students actually understood these. And it was quite, encourage them or say to see that at that school, the school was doing a great job of making the children aware of speaking well. And I'm glad to say that we were able to, we'll still roll this out on our social media page. We we're able to provide a two-term scholarship for five primary school students who did exceptionally well in the reading competition. And we're hoping that this will not be a one-off. And so we, we, we are still open to partnerships and sponsorship. And that's just a little way of contributing. And I hope that all of us on this call can um, also play a little part, like Leanne says, volunteer, like Ketira says, to get involved, parents and everyone get involved. And Dr. Chukuma also talked about the various ways that we can get involved, like um, extracurricular activities. So there's so much to be done. Uh, we started at primary school because it's the foundation. I mean, not sure, but primary is the next foundation. And all of us can really look into an area to get involved in because education is a broad area and we need all hands on deck. So thank you so much for coming this evening. I know it's it's time when everybody's supposed to be resting, but we're all here because we care about education, we're passionate about our country. So I want to thank you. We don't take your coming for granted. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janet. So I, I mean, I can't thank you enough. You know, Janet, I met her for the first time in Lomé. We went for the Yali homecoming. Most of you here are Yali fellows. And I only met Janet for the first time this past December in Lomé. And she's just been amazing. Uh, she has a pure heart of gold. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Um, no problem. Thank you, Dr. And all the speakers, I don't know them before, so you, you can imagine, it, it really warms my heart to see that people can just rally around the course without even knowing the person, but just the, the principle, let's do this. You know, that's what that resonated with me. So thank you, Dr. Chukuma. And I must say that the idea of the competition, in fact, um, was Dr. Chukuma's idea when he said to me, well, why do, you, why do we always talk? We should actually do something to contribute to the, to the community. And I said, okay, well, maybe this could. So he gave me the idea and I really want to thank him for that. And I want to thank Leanne. I want to thank Kitura. They came on board when I just, um, put out notice and they said we'll do this so thank you very much to all attendees thank you for your time Bumi, Godwin, um, 
I think he's left now. And I saw Emmanuel Ligue as well. And people on Facebook, my sister is watching on Facebook and several other people. Thank you all for coming. And uh, we hope to keep seeing you as we do our work as Glory Fraser Foundation this year. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Over to you. No problem. Thank you so much for your time. I think you've said it all. And let's continue following Glory Faceway Foundation on the various social media platforms. I mean, you can still go to Facebook and watch this stream. I'm going to watch the stream and because I'm going to go and have in-depth knowledge of what was shared here today. Thank you so much. And until next time, my name is Janet. I have it's been amazing being a part of this wonderful initiative. Thank you so much, Oge, God's glory for having me. Thank you each and every one of us for being here. Thank you so much. Let us enjoy our night and let's continue making the positive impact that we are always making. And let's not worry because sometimes it gets difficult, but let's keep the fire burning. Thank you so much. Let's continue to gather so that nothing will be lost and nothing will be wasted. Thank you so much for your time. Have a good evening. Bye. Yeah, bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.